I, that's all I can do for you is is shoot for engineer sexy. I I can't much do more than that. I which you know includes man bod. I am trying to get rid of my man bod. Every day. <laughs> I am not running every day. I'm doing the work. I'm putting the work in. I just want you to know. Okay, welcome to the stream, everybody. Uh, you are being recorded, so be on your best behavior. Uh, we are going to talk about many awesome things today. Uh, in this next hour, uh, most of them are completely random as usual. And, um, you know, you can always read the description to decide if you want to read this one. Or you know. We are still working on getting all of this into an actual podcast that you can listen to on your favorite podcast device. Uh, it takes work to do that and I have a job. And so that's why it's not happening. So um, the first question, uh, Ryan, do you want in? Do you want to come on in into our studio audience? Are you brave? I see you're in there. You're on our stage over here. You want to come in? I don't see the hand going up. I'm going to invite you. I tell you what, I'm going to invite you and then you can decide whether you want to talk or not. Because we're going to actually talk about something that Ryan brought uh, forward. Oh, Mr. Shells is here. Here, come on in, Mr. Shells. H how you doing there, Ryan? I am doing good. You're doing good? Awesome. We didn't do a sound check, so but you sound really great. Um. Ryan is famous for sniping uh, tech streams and taking them over by derailing them, which is really great because he derails my stream <laughs> <laughs> all the time, which I love. And we're going to get to talk about one of those derailments today. Uh, it's a rather controversial one, so we're going to that's a, we're going to save that one for a bit. Um, other more uh, and Matt, of course, is here. Matt, how's your sound? Is your sound working for you? Hi, guys. Matt, our, our faithful uh, representative on the on the panel here. Um, let me go to the questions of the day and see. So if you want a question answered, you can put it in the chat uh, and if, or you can send it to the topics, the questions, conversations and advice channel on uh, on Twitch. Um, and, and we'll go with that. Um, let me see if I can back up really quick and see if there's any ones that we haven't covered so far. Uh, let's see. Oh, <laughs> here's one. Here's an easy one. Uh, would it be possible for you to include timestamps in your videos? And the answer is yes. It would be very possible uh, as long as somebody else does it because I'm not going to do it. Uh, <laughs> I'm a, a band of one. Uh, so... And if there's anybody else who wants to volunteer, uh, I'm 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 more than happy to to let you kind of take the reins on I'm that. I'm going to volunteer for the podcast research. Oh, are you going to um, do the podcast research to for get me? that to get that going? Oh, um, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I mean, this is a community, so more 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 hands in the kitchen is good. Uh, you can always ask beginner questions. Yes, you definitely can ask beginner questions. Please, please ask them. Um, what else we got? So that was a quick and easy one. <laughs> so anyway, we had kind of a, a little back and forth. I won't share it here. Uh, there is a, 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 a there's another question here that I'm going to save for November, which is a kind of a silly, funny question, but we're not going to answer that one right now. You'll have to wait till November to hear that one. Um, here is one that I have a hard time thinking of on the spot, but we can get right into. What are the best three pieces of advice you've ever received? Wow. What I'm going to what are you, what I'm going to get put that to the group. You guys have any what's the best advice in IT that you've ever received? I mean, I the superlative is throwing me, right? Because they got to have like the best, right? Um I I think the best piece of advice is go search for it before you ask a question. Uh uh don't let yourself be misrepresented or undersold. I think that would be probably a big piece. And um, don't let people tell you what to do. Don't get mad. Get busy. You know, spend your time making stuff. That would be my quick answers to that. Um, it's really easy to get disenchanted with people who don't believe in your vision or want to do what you want to do. And uh, I think the best advice there is to, to do it anyway. Uh, on your own terms, but but not necessarily in, in the the way that they want you to. Uh, we have a new question here from i9mt. 
what is the best programming learning language to start as a beginner? This has got to be one of my most, my, people ask me all the time uh, this question and I, I promise you, so this particular podcast that we're doing, I will always answer the question, even if it's already been asked a thousand times, I swear, because I think everybody needs to hear the answer. That This is a very different Rob. There, at one time I would have yelled at you and said, why don't you go read the blog or something? And that's not, I don't do that anymore. Um, so uh, we have a number of people who have already suggested their answers here. Um, yeah, uh, th I did answer the programming question like literally two days ago, but I'll answer it again. Uh, the best, in fact, you can go listen to the video from yesterday. The best programming language to start with as a beginner uh, depends on what you want to do. So I'm going to ask you, and I and I MT if you are there, uh, what do you want to do with programming? I'm going to put you on the spot. And while you're thinking of that, uh, does anybody on our panel have an opinion they want to share while we wait for that, that answer? I thoroughly second that it is very <laughs> contextually dependent. Yeah, the answer. it is. It's contextual. That's the that's the right word. Um, a, and the, what is it, the X, but you mean Y question scenario? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's like I'll start. I'll, I'll, I'll dig. I'm, I'm hesitating here. I'll start by saying that the people who are more quick to answer this question are the ones you should probably be scared of, uh, because they they are not, in my opinion, they're not considering your best interests. Uh, they're gonna tell you what they think is the best thing based on their experience and what what they like and 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 where they are. And they they have, the faster they answer, the the the, the less. Uh, I suppose uh, concern for for you that they demonstrate because they're just you know injecting onto you what they think you should learn. Now, um, oh, Jay Beers, thank you for the raid. So we're answering the question: What is the best language to learn as a beginner? Uh, probably the most popular question to, that I've had to answer. Um, so the uh, using it for cybersecurity. Okay. So we, I asked I, I, I9MT the question back, what do you want to use it for? What do you want to get into? So when, when someone asks me, what's the best language for a beginner? I ask, well, what do you mean by beginner? And they say a beginning cybersecurity person. And I'm like, aha, okay. Uh, and so let's answer that specific question first. Uh, as a cybersecurity, it's great because Jay Beers, welcome for Jay Beers, everybody. Let's shout out Jay Beers. Thank you for the raid. And Jay Beers is an actual hey, hacker. Jay Beers, yeah. welcome. Yeah, Jay Beers is an actual hacker by trade. Uh, so I'm going to, I love. Uh, he you know, is a very good hacker. He is. Um, he's, he's yeah, I've guy. watched his channel a lot before yours. Yeah, and he's he's been doing good things. And so we have hackers on Twitch and YouTube that are fun to watch. And some of them that are, you know, they don't grift as much as others. And Jay Beers would be among them. Um, very down home kind of streamer. Love Jay Beers a lot. So if you if you want to watch somebody who's actually hacking, they can't hack on a lot of hacking can't be done live. Uh, but it's interesting that Jaybirds is here because the person who said they were asking about their first language is asking about cybersecurity. So I'm going to put the question to Jay Bears. By the way, Jay Bears, if you want to join our Discord on our panel, uh, we'd love to have you anytime. Uh, the panel is on Discord, and you can just go raise your hand in there, go look for the stage, and you could actually chime in and and say whatever you wanted to about that. Uh, but I'll give my answer while you decide if you want to join us. So, first of all, uh, Bash. <laughs> okay. If you don't know Bash, I mean, Bash is the default Linux shell on every Linux system on the planet, uh, except for Alpine, and which is, you know, a container distro of Linux. Um, you probably want to learn PowerShell. Uh, if you're going to go into cybersecurity, I, I'm not particularly fond of it, but you need to learn PowerShell. PowerShell is going to be a big part of the automation that's going to be needed. Uh, if you're going to be cybersecurity is a big field, so when you say cybersecurity, I need to know: Are you talking about web pen testing, or are you talking about zero day discovery? Right. If you're talking about zero day discovery in forensics, now you're talking about C and assembly, and you're going to want to know how computers work. Right. Much much different thing. Very very low level. If if you're going to do pen testing, you're going to need and you're going to be attacking websites. Uh, you're going to have to know HTML, CSS, JavaScript, uh, SQL, TypeScript, and Python, so you can automate that stuff. 
And you're probably going to want to learn Ruby uh, in any cybersecurity profession because the entire Metasploit database, I mean, I understand recently they, they changed, they wrote a very uh, elaborate blog about why they chose with Ruby instead of Perl back in the day, I think in 2009. Uh, but they've gone since to accept any uh, exploits written in any language. Um, and then I personally think you should learn Go on top of that. In 2021, you can go read the blog on this. There's a there's actually a Bloomberg article, I think, on it. Uh, the percentage of malware increased by 4,000%. And so people are deploying malware like crazy because they can they can you know rehash and uh c code or whatever because it's compatible with c and do a lot of things and it's also uh cross compilable it's hard to decompile uh so so go is a great great hacker language these days uh so that those are my recommendations um and that's a lot of languages but if you're going to go into cybersecurity, i mean let's be real you know you, you got to know a lot of languages being a hacker means you got to know a lot of things uh, and if you have never coded before, uh, you know, I, I, especially if you're going to do forensics and stuff like that, I, I would, I would start with C. I don't know if that would be my first language. I'd probably start with JavaScript. I, I personally, I would start with bash and then I would layer on go. And if you want to do that, I'm going to plug it. Uh, we're going to start go programming, uh, in the boost, uh, Sunday from two to four, no, two to six, sorry. Uh, and we this is the, the work week coming up uh, tomorrow in two days, actually is the first day we'll be doing Go programming in a boost in for the last three years. So we're going to be doing Go programming from scratch as if you've never done anything else. Uh, and we're doing questions and answers, uh, questions, conversations, and answers. Uh, behavior analytics, working hours, the account gets flagged and disabled. So you like it. Yes. All right. Uh, the answer is all of the languages. <laughs> yes, that is the proper answer. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's what you do have to learn them all, right? Uh, Python, of course, is a big hacker language too, because so many of this, of this, you know, the kits, the root kits, and everything have been written in Python. Uh, I hate to say it, but but in Java, you know, Burp Suite is written in Java. I hate Burp Suite. I hate it. Just test it, but because it's written in Java mostly, but it that's a, you know that language is written in, 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 but you're going to, if you're going to be a good hacker, you're going to be able to read the language and see where the exploit is in GitHub and then go in and take advantage of it. If you're going to do zero day stuff, uh, there's no best languages, but, but the, the question was, what is the best beginner language for, uh, for cybersecurity? And, and my answer is, is bash, uh, probably Python and go after that. And if you're doing front end stuff, you know, JavaScript, if you're doing back end stuff, C and assembly after that. Uh, what are we are? Where are we? Uh, from, uh, let's see. Okay, we got other questions here. Um, well, that's a good question. The question is from Cyanide for Dinner. What for the early years of careers? What are the pros cons of working in a startup versus a big firm in a big company? Wow, what do you think? Ryan, we're going to get to your question, I promise. You're being very patient. If you have to go to bed, I understand. Let me know. <laughs> so, what should I have for lunch? Why? Because I'm so bloated today? <laughs> what did I have for lunch? Let's ask that. Let's answer that one fast. I had a hot dog with sauerkraut. <laughs> because I'm trying to do the keto thing a little bit. And I'm trying to reset my bacteria in my intestine. There. That one's out of the way. That was easy. Am I a roller skater? Hell yeah. Uh, I love skating. I, I love roller skating and, 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 and skateboarding. I haven't done it in a while though. It's too hot. It's too hot lately. You, you had a German glizzy. Is that what it is? I don't even know if that's the name. Is that what the name is? Yes, I'm a skater and that's what I had for lunch. Oh my God. Look at all these great questions coming in. Can cloud computing be used to set up a botnet? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. It's just not going to be very high and hidden. That's what I'm going to do, by the way. Uh, I'm going to set up uh, my own internal botnet to manage my own systems internally. Uh, and I'll be using Bonsai and writing that in Go. So that is something I'm looking forward to doing. Okay, let's go back to this bigger question. Oh, gosh. All these great questions. Great, great questions. But let's 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 answer one of these. I'm catching. I'm capturing your question. Don't you worry. But um, that's why it's taking me so long. But I, there's a big one here. 
the, the, the question here is for the early years of your career, what are the pros and cons for working in a startup versus a big firm or company? Um, and I'm going to tell you a story. I, I like to do that. Uh, it's a cloud computing platform. That's exactly right. Um, I started my IT career. Uh, I mean, I was a lab person in a multimedia lab uh, in college, and I learned about the internet there, taught myself HTML, and, you know, learned the blink tag and things like that and got a job as a webmaster because of it. Um, and worked for a lot of startups. Uh, because at the time, that's all there was in the internet. There was only startups. There were only startup internet service providers in 94. And uh, so I got a lot of experience with it. And I, I got to tell you, my heart is there. Uh, I had to go on unemployment because there was no jobs in Utah, Provo, Provo Utah, in that area uh, for uh, anybody doing internet service providers. They had, to, they had to close the shop because nobody wanted it. Representatives from WordPerfect and Novell actually told me why would we ever? I was the director of sales as well. And they said, "Why? Why would we ever want an internet connection? That's for military. That's for military and educators." That was an exact quote. And I would give anything to have that recorded, <laughs> because, you know, and um, so I left. I left, and I went up to. I, I interviewed with an internet service provider in in Oregon, Portland, Oregon. It was very. Uh, I mean, the well was very popular up there. Teleport was a. Uh, BBS, that means you dial in on your modem and do all the thing. And they become an internet service provider just kind of uh, automatically because they were already providing online services. And they were huge. They had like six, 7,000 people uh, in the area in like 94, 95, which is huge. And I, they hired me uh, for at the time for 34,000 a year and apologized that they couldn't pay me double that for doing pro programming, which I taught myself on my Mac. Um, and, and they were also a startup. They were a small startup. They eventually got bought out, and I made you know a, a pretty penny there uh, when they got bought out by Earthlink some three years later. And I got headhunted into Nike to become their webmaster, their internal webmaster. And, and and then I worked for a big company. I worked for Nike, which is relatively big, and it was a much different experience. Um, and so the question is, what are the pros and cons? And um, yeah, it was all about the pro back then. <laughs> So, the the pro, so if you if and and then after just to give you my work history so you, I can give you some context I went to, um, I went to IBM after that and I had I had headed into IBM doing you know Java development which I never did, and uh, ended up staying there for 10, 15 years. Yeah, here comes the go dancer, and and then I ended up going to. Uh, I got recruited. I mean, out of that, I started my own business. I actually, you know, quit, started my own business, which was a small business again, uh, very, very small that I ran, had all of the control of it and thought about franchising at one point. And then, uh, and then I, I couldn't support myself eventually over COVID. And so I went back to corporate America and I'm now I'm working for a big, big, big multinational, uh, corporation with, you know, thousands and thousands of computers and, and employees all over the world. Um, so I've, I've been on both sides of that fence, the small versus the big, and, uh, I've worked for the startups. Um, when I was at Nike, actually, they told us, they could put us in a room and they said, this is a startup company, uh, as far as you're concerned. And we expect the, that type of thing out of you. Um, so I decided to not do that. And I left and I got recruited out of there because they wanted us to do, so the, the, the pros, the, the cons of a startup is they're going to want you to work insane hours because they're going to say that you have ownership over the whole thing and they are not going to pay you for that. They're not, they're going to, they're going to expect you to be a part of it. So unless you're a founder, or you have a lot of stock options. I mean, you can be, you can become a crazy, crazy, crazy millionaire. Uh, if, if you like that, if you like that kind of thing, um, uh, and I, I don't, I don't like it. I, I, I don't like it. What I do like about the pro of the startup that I worked for was that it was a sort of a family. None of these people were actual family, but this, the 30 or so people that worked at Teleport, including the people, the gray beards, we'll say, who, who brought me under their wing and taught me Linux and, and, and had patience for this Perl programmer who was using a Mac to do everything, you know. Uh, they, I mean, I mean, my heart is like really kind of, 
moving right now when I think about these people because they were so genuine. They were so amazing. And I had such a close connection with them. I wasn't their friend. It's not like they would let me, you know, I was like a sad puppy, like always looking to see what they wanted to do and say, Hey, what are you doing? You know, I like wag my tail. Like you playing with Solaris today. Wow. That's awesome. You know, I was that guy. And, and, but they, they had patience with me and they helped me. And the, the, the people on my web team to this day, I consider like family. I haven't seen them in a long time. Lynn, if you're out there, I miss you. Um, and, you know, I, to this day, I, I will never, ever forget the relationships I had with with those people. And I've heard people say that about startups before. Um, and so I guess it depends on the startup. You know, if, if your startup is one that got cobbled together at Y Combinator and got thrown a bunch of money and and, and then sold off to Condé Nast, like, like uh, what happened to Reddit when, you know, um, uh, Aaron Schwartz was involved with that. And then Aaron Schwartz left the whole thing. And to quote somebody who cited him, Aaron Schwartz, you know, went to the top of the shit heap, which was Silicon Valley, plucked the rose and climbed back down again. Uh, because, because Silicon Valley is full of shit. And, and so if I don't want people to associate Silicon Valley with startup culture, uh, it is largely associated with, if you watch Silicon Valley, the series, uh, you'll, you'll see that that's a thing. Um, but those are those are things that you know that are a problem. They're they are definitely a problem. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to swear a little bit there because that was the actual quote. Um, so this a startup. If you work for a startup and it's the right startup, it might become they might become they might become people that become uh, you know your lifelong friends and people that you love. You know you can do that anywhere, but. Uh, and, and, and that's, I understand that's mostly an American thing. That doesn't happen in Germany as much, places like that where, you know, work is work. And so anyway, I just want to put that out there. Uh, the last thing I want to say about this, though, is don't give up on boring big companies. Uh, some of the most amazing, intriguing companies that you'll ever work for do not talk about how all the amazing things they're doing because they're a little bit more conservative. I happen to work for one of these companies right now. I'm working for a company, please don't dox me. I'm working for a company that has its own class A IP address. It has tens of thousands of employees all over the world that produces multiple billions of dollars in revenue every year and is doing amazing things for the world. Um, and, and I absolutely love this company. I, I love it. It's a very conservative company. It, it just batted its eyes at the recent problems that it had. They did have, you know, layoffs just like everybody else, but not anything, uh, for that, you know, kind of, that kind of scale that we've seen in Silicon Valley. So, so don't put off a big company, right? Uh, even if the co big company has got problems internally, I mean, there are other people on the internet and, and YouTubers and people that would tell you don't ever work for one of these companies, uh, including Google and Microsoft and these other places. I'm not that guy. I think that you should be able to work for one of these companies and categorize, I'm working for a company, I'm working toward the greater good for this particular thing. Uh, and yes, they do some evil things, but I'm doing my best inside of the company to change that. Uh, as opposed to, yeah, the changes from within, which is, which is a recurring theme in Mr. Robot, by the way. Um, and because, I mean, if you're just going to yell at them from the outside, that's not going to, that's not going to change anything. Um, I mean, tech companies still, yeah, the company that I work for has got some of the most amazing technology I've ever experienced. Uh, in fact, they, they have a high performance cluster that I, I would dare to say is, is nowhere near anything that's in Silicon Valley. Uh, but nobody would know that because they don't tell everybody. And I can't tell you because I don't want to tell you. Uh, you're looking for a large bank of a company that's not doing that again. Yeah, banks are a different thing. Uh, banks are a different creature. Some people can work for them. Some people can't. Some people can work for crypto companies. Some people can't. So that's really largely up to you. There's a lot of people who, there's, especially the younger generation these days, they're able to separate the ethics of how they make their money from the ethics of who they are as a person. And I'm, I'm not as adept at doing that. I can't do that. I have to be able to 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 say that you know i i believe that the general direction of this company is going to be for the benefit of humanity uh and you know for example i could work for for example i could work for an oil company or something like that if i knew that i was working on the renewable energy portion of the company 
and I knew that the company was committed to getting off oil, I could actually dedicate my life to working on helping them get off oil. You know, hypothetically, that's something I could do. Uh, if I knew that that was a company direction, if, if I knew that it would, that, that was not sincere in any way, there's no way I could do it. Uh, so yeah. Uh, let's see here. So I, I mean, that's all. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Uh, Matt or Ryan, do you have any thoughts on working for a startup company versus a big firm? Anyone? Uh, nothing really to, new to contribute, just that it's a trade-off of a lot of effort up front for potential payoff later. And yeah. Like, but it's a risk trade-off. It is. Stable, reliable paycheck or working for a startup and yeah. possibly having to look for a new job in six months, but also possibly like you know, getting equity and having it take off. Yeah. 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 Equity is, is, is a gamble. Right. And when you're young, I, I will say this, if I was, when I, when I was young, when I was young and unmarried, I would be taking all kinds of gambles with startup companies. I'd have the energy. I I'd be able, I mean, who knows, right. You'd be getting experience, uh, and, and stuff like that, but you just don't know. Right. You don't know. And, and I'm at an age where our stability matters a lot more to me when, as soon as I started having kids, that was when it got me to work at IBM, by the way. Because, I mean, it was a big blue. It never goes under. People don't get fired there, at least so I thought. And uh, so that's that's kind of what led to to, to what I did. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are tough considerations. But if you're young and hungry and, you know, you can sleep on a couch like like Tom famously writes about doing when he started GitHub uh, or he started Gravatar first and then GitHub, you know, then go for it. Go for it. But if you're, oh, my God, security life. <laughs> Security Live just gave out 13 gift subs. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I have to say thank you to that. I appreciate that. So so the answer is, it depends on you. If you have a high tolerance, I mean, come on, I was, a, I was, a, I was an unemployed Russian cruise director. And then I, I went around and did all that great stuff. I had a lot of great adventures. And then I had a child. And as soon as I had the child, I was like, no, I don't want the risk anymore. And as soon as, you know, we went through COVID, I went back to work for Corporate America. Why? Because there was insurance. It was a big company that just yawned when the whole Silicon Valley thing went down, you know, this this stock, this burst, this bubble burst thing. And they just yawned at the whole thing because they had so much momentum. And so your priorities are going to change depending on where you are in life. It's even better when you work for a contracting firm that works for one of these big firms. Because now, you know, if they if they downsize you, you've got a company that's immediately interested in getting you employed someplace else like that. And at my age, security and stability is more important than uh, flexibility. Now, I will say that I am more flexible now. I'm more available for flexibility uh, now than I than I was uh, before, because um, you know my kids are grown. Right when I had young kids at home. I was constantly stressed that I would get fired or I wouldn't have any money. I was the sole source of income. And again, these are all questions you're going to need to make for yourself. So I, I like this question. I'm kind of dwelling on it because I think it's an important question in the advice category, for especially for, for people of all ages. They're, they're making assessments um, based on different stats and you know, states of life. And, and it's really easy to make the wrong choice. Uh, uh, you know, and the other thing that Scoo's kind of sad is people will end up with a family and then they'll resent that they've lost the flexibility they had before. And I don't know what to tell you about that. I mean, as soon as you start to have a family and you got roots, you have obligations. So that means you have, you're obligated to take, you know, less risky decisions when it comes to your career, uh, depending on how risk averse you are, you, you are and, and your family is. And that can be bad, right? Because um, sometimes you want to take risks. In fact, I heard, I read a thing that said that people that go to Ivy League colleges are actually less successful in business because they they had got into Ivy. If they're not if they're not what are they called? If they're not um, people that were grandfathered in or whatever because they had people that what is it called when they get in for free because their parents were there? Legacy. So something I didn't know. So Ivy League colleges, sixty percent of the attendance of people at Ivy League colleges are legacy. That means they didn't take any SAT tests. They didn't do anything. They just got in. And, and if you think going to an Ivy League college makes you good and you deserve more of a job than somebody else, forget it. In fact, when I know that somebody's gone to an Ivy League college, immediately I'm like already judging them and wondering what the what the hell is like going on. Um, because it's nepotism. It's like that's so 
Ivy League colleges, 60% of admissions is, is people that are on legacy who didn't have to do anything. And I know that actually specifically because I, there's one case that I happen to know, a Cornell student who went there and got that. Um, so, you know, and then you got the other people who break in and who like bust their butt and they could do great on the SAT and everything and then they get in the college and now they're, now they're in the same classrooms with people who just walked in. And so this is where, this is where you get the Steve Ballmers of the world. Steve Ballmer was one of these people who went to Harvard and told, sucked, dropped out. Bill Gates, same thing. I mean, he at least tried harder. So, you know, they don't have to try. They get, they get all the, the, the stuff from these big Ivy League colleges. So why am I telling you? Why am I ranting about Ivy League colleges? Because some of the Ivy League colleges uh, where this is a thing don't have the, the same kind of, um, you know, the motivation for startups or, or some people can actually have, they, they have more resilience to taking risk and but the study that i read about said that people that got good grades uh were less likely to be successful in business and i would give anything to find a link to that study if i can find it again i'll let you know uh and the reason was according to the study that they were too risk averse they they wanted to get the a and get in and go and that uh, some colleges actually had, and Davidson comes to mind, um, my wife and I had to talk about this, that the colleges would have to actually break the students of this risk aversion so that they would take risks. Uh, yeah, it decreases their the appetite for risk. So they would, they would, they're like, no, I just got to get an A so I can get a job. Blah, blah, blah. So they, they, meanwhile, they got people like jobs and they just you know, went barefoot to, you know, font class at, at Reed college for free and had no, you know, skin in the game at all. And he could take all the risks he wanted to. He could call up people, say, Hey, can you help me out? And so the people that take risks are the ones that are successful in business. And, um, and so, I, 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 they were making the association that people that got higher GPAs were less risk averse. That's their study. You could probably do a search and look for it. I thought that was super interesting because, you know, I, 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 I take way too many risks with my life. I always have. Uh, and for better or worse, <laughs> for better or worse, it gets me in trouble. You know, it's like, it's like, Oh, you know, because I mean, you, you take a risk and you know, you're going to get stuff wrong and most people do, but if you don't, you know, so, so the entrepreneurs, and this is the, this is behind the whole thing where most successful entrepreneurs are dropouts. They, you know, you just go do the math. They, they don't, you know, do all of those things. So, uh, that's a, that's a fun topic. I, I could talk about that one all day. Uh, we have 20 minutes left, so let's keep going with the next questions here. Um, let's see. Society paralyzes a lot of young minds. Education debt is very effective way to limit creativity. Hell yeah. Uh, you give tink subs for something. <laughs> uh, what did I have for lunch? I told you already, right? I had a hot dog with with sauerkraut. I told you that one already. Are you a skater? Yes, I skate. Uh, and I I have the scars to show it. That's a recent one. Uh, I may actually do some of that tomorrow. We'll see. Can I, we we did the botnet one? Who? What made me get into programming? Um. Anybody else want to answer that? <laughs> Well, I, I want to hear Matt. Do you have something to say about that, Matt? What, what made you get into programming? <laughs> I'm going to put people on the spot. I'm not getting put on the spot for that one. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. I mean, I can. I'll answer it. Does anybody else want to try? I, I don't have to answer them all. I mean, I, 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 the answer is not to get chicks. I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, I got into programming because. I liked it there. Modding games got you into programming shards. Um, honestly, the first time uh, my first experience programming, I, this is a whole story. I don't know how much of it I should tell. Uh, I was, I was a nerd uh, who wore double headgear um, and, and had glasses in the whole bit. Who was beat up every day in his locker uh, by the bully. Um, and uh, I, when I was 12 or so, in junior high and I, I i would take refuge in the in the media lab and so i got to use the atari 400 that was there if you don't know an atari 400 or a beautiful computer and uh mr bevins uh took pity on me really now that looking back on it i realized what he did he would let me in before anybody else and 
And he would let me in and he would let me go mess with the computer. It's the only computer in the entire school uh, of all the schools. And there wasn't even computers in the administration room. And, and I sat down there and I had the whole room to myself. It was totally quiet. And I, you know, this wonderful Atari screen and basic, you know, Atari basic. And I was like, man, what can I do with this? And I'm looking through the examples and I'm like, Ooh, randomization. And so I was a big Dungeons and Dragons nerd and I wrote my own uh, character generator. Oh, you're, it was a Tandy. Tandy's a great one. Commodore. Oh yeah, they're all good, right? And and I just was I just came alive in front of this thing. I, I can tell you, I remember how dark the room was because it was so early. Why did we make people go to school this early? By the way, why why are kids when they need the most sleep going to school at like six a.m.? I have no idea why that is, but it just I was there. It was dark. It was cold, and. Uh, it wasn't a teacher, it was a media lab instructor. And he actually, uh, a lot of, I found later that a lot of media people, media, media lab people do that because they don't have to have the overhead of being a teacher. They can just pick out people to help. And I'm pretty sure he did that with me. And, um, you know, I, I was really fortunate that he did that. I mean, I, 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 I have pretty serious trauma from all of the bullying that I went through during those years. But, uh, that bully is in prison and the other bully that used to do it is dead. Uh, he killed him. Yeah, he died in high school, uh, drunk driving. So karma's a bitch, I guess. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so I wrote a Dungeons and Jag Dragons program and uh, I was able to say that I legitimately rolled like 320s or something like that. Actually, looking back on it, and we're going to do this program, by the way. We're going we're gonna to write this program and go... Uh, and I mean, bullies are also victims, by the way. I'm not picking. Bullies are actually some of the, this guy, the, the one kid I'm sure was beat at home every day. Uh, and so anyway, uh, I, you know, I did the whole Dungeons and Dragons thing. I'm, I'm pretty sure that my generator, I just did a random generation between zero and 18. Here's a fun fact. Why is that wrong? Why is a random, we're going to do this. We're going to code this and go this week, this week or next week during the bo the boost we're going to make a we're going to make this exact program that i that i wrote uh it's pretty fun because we can randomly roll the character dexterity strength and all that stuff right why is picking a random number between 0 and 18 wrong and we got any statistical theory people out there okay so the way to generate a character is to roll 3d20 sorry 3 1d6 Three D6 dice, and you get each one of those dice gives you between one and six, and you add them together. Yep. And so I'm almost positive that I did it wrong, and I didn't realize that until 2013 when I was teaching this to my students. I went back through it, and I realized, oh, my God, I did this completely wrong uh, for learning a new language. Uh, let me ask, well, let's see if we can get to that question. So, so that, so yeah, that's how I learned to program. And then, and then my, my mom, uh, bless her, she, she saw that the need that I wanted to do it. I was so enthralled in it. I was so beat up as a nerd and she went out of her way. She actually paid money. She didn't have the money. I was the oldest of eight children in a Mormon family with, you know, one income and they paid the money for me to go to computer camp for one week and I programmed on an Atari 800 with a big noisy mechanical keyboard and I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I I cannot, I can, when I think back to that experience coding on that Atari 800 in that summer camp, I knew that I wanted, I mean, I, she, my, my mom had taught me to type when I was eight because my handwriting was so bad on a royal, and I, so my, I already like things that involve typing. And I just exploded with excitement. In fact, so much so that that Christmas, and I, I probably tear up a little bit here. <laughs> she, they went out on a limb and they 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 bought uh, an Atari 800 for me when you know the family was clearly in need. Um, and I, uh, it was a family computer, but it was pretty much for me. And um, so here I am, a 12 year old with Atari. Every time I see. Uh, What's that show? Ready Player One. Every time I see Ready Player One, I really associate with the creator of the game because his ti the timing of it, of him, was so close. To I wasn't as smart as him, of course, but the timing of it was really, really close to, 
to, to what I was doing. I had, had been playing video games and really loved it and everything. And, and so I had an Atari 800 and I wrote, I, I started hacking on, you know, Bruce Lee games and I would write my own games and I would play Zork and, and I would, um, I eventually at school I could work on, I wrote a, a missile command knockoff where we would poke and peek, uh, pixels and draw lines directly on the screen in 255, you know, positions. And it was, it was like missile command, except for you had to type in the numbers every time you wanted to shoot. It was really lame, but you know, it, it was 1986 or something. So, um, uh, you know, I have really good memories of that. Uh, to, uh, to tell you the truth, though, the thing that has always kept me coding has been getting something out of it, whether it's a game uh, or hacking somebody or playing a trick on someone or getting paid or putting mostly putting information. I'm a big fan of communication. So uh, those are the reasons that I got into programming and I've stayed in it. Those are the reasons I've stayed in it. I am not a programmer. I don't do lead code for fun. Uh, I think lead code's great for those who want to do it. I just, that's just not me. Um, and uh, there's brilliant, brilliant people that like that. And I, I, I don't, I, I've been just learning Lambda calculus, uh, in this book I'm reading and I really like Lambda calculus. So I think it's cool and all, uh, but I, I don't know if I would want to code in it just, just cause, I mean, I do like solving puzzles and stuff, but you know, I, I don't, I just don't think I'm in as, into it as much as other people. So, uh, that's all I have to say about that. Anybody else want to chime in? If not, I'm gonna I'll move on. How many we got? We got 15 more minutes. I, I will say lambda calculus is beautiful. Yeah. What'd you say about that? I missed that part. Uh, that that lambda calculus is truly beautiful. It's so fun, isn't it? I mean, that it's one of the reasons I just continue to love JavaScript because you can represent lambda calculus almost exactly uh, using fat hour functions, um, mm -hmm. and it just it's just so so pretty and i'm ashamed to admit that after reading this chapter you know we're, we're going into the turing stuff you know and i for the first time i think i might actually understand how a computer works i mean i've tried so many times to understand you know you know digital computation uh but but yeah this this chapter on it is really good in fact i'm gonna go get the book for you really quick Uh, people are one of the questions is is how do you learn and stuff so this is the book i've been reading um it's called uh, the imposter's handbook i i called it wrong a cs primer for self-taught programmers from rob connery um and and he he makes a point of telling you that he's very informal he's like this is not a, a dry book but it gives you the minimum high level overview of all of the core things from a, a computer science education and, you know, I mean, the, the entire Lambda Calculus uh, chapter is like eight pages and he kind of makes a fun of it at the end. Where he's like, OK, that's too much. All right, we'll move on, you know. And um, this is uh, exactly what I needed. It, it's, it's written by a guy who, who, who really just wanted to understand the high level of stuff and, and just proceed after that. And he talks about, uh, uh, what's it called, um, complexity theory and you know, stuff that can be solved in P time and all that. And I, and NP time, I've heard of people make jokes about that stuff and I never really understood it, but he spends like, you know, like five or six pages on it and you get a really, really good summary of it. So, uh, the name of the book is, and I have nothing to do with this, by the way, if I had an Amazon affiliate thing, I would do it, but I don't. So the book is, is the imposter's handbook, uh, a CS primer for self-taught programmers. So this guy is definitely not a computer science person, uh, but they've chosen to, uh, to, you know, he, he makes fun of himself because he's had people go into it and like rip to shreds his, cap, his chapter on Lambda Calculus and say, this is completely wrong. And he actually tells you where he got it wrong. And he had somebody who knows Lambda Calculus come in and clean it up for him. And that's my style. That's all. I'm, if you know me, you know, that's me, right? I'm all, I'm fond of making mistakes and having people correct me, you know, better, better than I do. So I love this book. It's the, the language of it's really good and everything. Uh, I'm not, I've got quite a bit more to, uh, to go. Um, it, it, it's in my my, my bathroom. <laughs> of course, there's the innovators, which we've been reading every day. I've been reading the innovators a little bit every other day. Uh, we just barely started that one too. If you if you really want to understand where uh, computer science came from and everything, that that that's a mandatory read as well. And I've been like eking through that a little bit every day. 
Uh, okay, we got another 10 minutes. See, Velocity's got their hand up. Oh, they might have something to say. We got to ask them what they want to say. Give me a second here. Uh, Z Velocity, you are invited in. Welcome. Bro, Rob, you forgot about me, man. Oh, I, 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 I tried to notice. You're late this. to the party, bro. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, I might be a little late. <laughs> well, I'm happy to have you. Oh. Uh. How you doing? I lo- like, I- I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I'm weird or not, but I've been looking for it. Like I, a few weeks ago when Rob started doing these, or at least when I started participating in them and, and, and discord, cause I've always been a fan of the stream. I'm like looking forward to this shit every day after work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me like, too. I kind of made it a seriously. routine. Yeah, oh, it's fun. That's, that's good to hear. I mean, cause, cause, yeah. cause I need it too. You know, it's like, Hey, let's just get together and shoot the breeze and talk about silly things and yeah, just shoot the shit. I mean, I've been supporting your stream oh, for forever. Uh, like 13 <laughs> months. And then I, I took a look at your Git repo and then I, I'm like, oh, I'm going to support your Git repo because it's cool stuff on there. You know, so uh, they're going to think I paid you to say that they're going to like, what's he putting in? Yeah, now? I'm sponsored by Rob. <laughs> Rob, he uh, he got me a job with Kate. Like so I'm making like yeah, 50 Speaking of know, that, I, Rob. okay. All right, let's move on. All right. So there's, there's actually a really good question here about jobs. Um, uh where is it here let me see if i can find it again god there are a lot, a lot of questions today uh mastering programming language first directly and starting mastering programming language first or jump to a new project directly then start a new language Ooh, let's let's do that one before we move on so what do you think so we master a programming language first or jump to a project when when they start a new when they start a new language what does that question mean? Mm-hmm. Who asked that question? I didn't get the name. Uh, it sounds language. like it. Fuck. It sounds like I. Sh- I think neither. What's that? I think the answer is neither. Neither. What's your yes. best answer? Like I think the answer is how do I get started? I think that's really what they're asking. Yeah, but- I think I think the answer is start learning the language, <sighs> learn some of the basics, get like control constructs down, well, basic yeah. language features. And then start yeah. project. Yeah. Well, I kind of, I kind of, yeah. And I agree with you. I kind of said this the other day. I don't know if you remember, Rob. Like, pick a programming language. Um, you know, but, and everything's opinionated, right? But yeah. nowadays, it's like people. Like, I, I was in university eight years ago. They're still teaching Java as the first. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? And now, and I agree with you. Go is is a really good language, but I don't know. What would be your first programming language to learn? Because your, before the very, that, very first one, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that I, I, yeah, I'm still taught, right? And yeah. I feel like I fucked up the way I did stuff, right? Yeah. So what would be the go-to if you were to teach a class today? It doesn't matter if it's high school, university, or to your to your son. What would be the first programming language? Well, that's funny because I've actually answered that one for myself many times. I started out with Python and then Python fizzled out because people couldn't do graphic stuff with it. So they wanted JavaScript. So then I taught JavaScript first. And now I'm trying to do, because there's a different audience, I'm trying to do Bash as the first language with Go as the second. So uh, we're talking about people who have absolutely no idea what they want to do with life yet. Uh, Mm. You know, and in the absence of any any interest specifically, we had people asking about cybersecurity. No, I'm not learning Turtle. (laughs) So, I mean, that's people learn like, yeah. You know, algorithmic languages and stuff. Uh, I think, though, that if you have a project... So I, I'm going to kind of give up a little bit about the boost coming up. Uh, you're writing a shell script right now? Great. And it's not on Amazon? Oh, I don't know where to get it. Maybe I'll have to read it. It's actually really hard to read. I would be. I would have to like do page by page or something. Um, so I think that one of the mistakes that people make when they start out is they bite off too much uh, when they're trying to learn on their own. So they'll, somebody will say, I want to make a Discord bot. And yeah. they have no idea how to code. They haven't done anything. And that definitely works for some people. But most people, that's too much to bite off. Uh, usually they need to bite off smaller exercise. And I call them mini projects because they're kind of between exercise scale and mini project in a project scale, like a Discord bot would be a project. Well, right? Rob, do you want to know what the problem is? Is because you go on YouTube and that's like the the first oh, thing you see, five million views. Right. Okay, let's code a Discord bot. Like, but then if you go and like, and I'm not here to 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 like, because I, I can't wait till me and Rob disagree on certain stuff. But I do <laughs> agree with him on some stuff. Like, if you were to teach someone to say, "Hey, I want to get into tech. I want to learn 
ins and out. I do agree with you on a lot of your fundament, like a, a lot of stuff, like teaching Batch first, and then and then you know going on to Python, JavaScript, and then Go, yeah. right? Yeah. Go. I think a lot of people, you know, with there's a lot of boomers, right, in yeah. in in, in uh, the programming world, and a lot of them are smart, but a lot of them aren't. Then up to date with we're stuff, gonna see. especially at the job I work at. <laughs> yeah, we're we're gonna see uh, how, how how that's gonna go. To tell you the truth, it's gonna be interesting. Yeah, uh, but flow and algorithms. There, a lot of people swear by just teaching non-specific languages when they start, uh, in order to teach algorithms and loops and flow no. and all and no. functions and all of that. You're gonna and they're not you're not teaching the fu the fundamentals. Yeah, I, man. I, uh, <laughs> like where are the fundamentals? I I think that I mean I I understand why people say that, but. The, the 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 question was should i have a project to learn on and it's almost impossible it is impossible to have a project with just a generic algorithm uh, if you want a project you know you, so we're going to see this on sunday i'm going to say it again we're going to we're going to do the first uh go programming and this time we're going to use what i call these mnemonic mini projects so there's hello world of course and then there's uh, Bridge Keeper, which is based on the Monty Python skit, and then there's you know uh, Nyan Cat, and I, I have these. It's just something that evolved over time. That, that really don't take credit. It was kind of just an evolution, helping the kids learn. And we would take these little silly things. I said, "What should we code today?" And they said, "Let's code the waffles meme," you know, at, which is ancient, but you know. And they would, we would create the meme and I'd say, "Okay, well, what can we learn from this meme?" And then we would put those things like a loop or four loops or something like that in these tiny little you know 23 line scripts and then they they would have fun like syncing up the, the the code to the video and they would remember that concept and 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 wit who's been in the stream several times he's now off of college uh had talked to me once after i changed it and tried to make bigger projects he said you know i really love that that approach you did because of the scale and, and i didn't realize you know, and it was very organic. It wasn't a conscious decision on my part. This is just the way it happened. Um, but he said, I love the scale because there, every time I wanted to do a for loop, I could associate it with, you know, waffles. Or if I wanted to do uh, functions and if statements, I associated it with Bridgekeeper. So he made these mnemonic associations with these really silly memes. And he had a, a, a small project that he could go back and repeat over and over again uh, to, to reinforce that particular part of the language. It was all in Python back then. So uh, so we're going to try to do that same approach in Go. And I'm, I'm trying to find all my old Go code, uh, Python code for that kind of thing. You know, we would do, and then I started kind of getting too big in scope. Uh, we would we would actually start to do, like we, we tried to do, uh, uh, we tried to do a game, uh, what's the game? Uh, Battleship. We try to do Battleship. Battleship is crazy hard to do for a beginner <laughs> it, because it's matrixes, you know, and it's got matrices. It's got stuff in there that you're, you don't expect, and it ends up growing out of scale really fast. So, but, but a little thing like a binary counter can do that, or, you know, an animation of Nyan Cat on the screen, or, um, you know, any number. We did a, we did a you know, uh, formatting with, I mean, you're going to see there's a the number of, and, and I like to write up these challenges, I call them, in, 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 without uh, a specific language in mind so that you can say, well, I want to learn how to do this in this language and you can just apply that to it. So that's how, that's going to be happening on, 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 uh, on Friday. Uh, I'm sorry, on Sunday, we're going to do that for the first time and go and, and we'll see, we'll see how well that goes. Um, Basically, if your project takes more than an hour or two, because I only had an hour with them, right? If your project takes more than an hour or two for them to do, it's too big, because they can't. It's too much, too much to to, to bite off in, in that amount of time. Uh, so, so anyway, yeah, yeah. And this is if you wanted to learn, this, if you want to compare languages, this is a good way to do it too, because if you want to, if you want to rush, compare Rust to Go, for example, or Python. In fact, I used to have a thing called um, uh, you know polyglot programming. I started a book that I we'll never finish uh, that had like five languages and we did C, Python, JavaScript, uh, Go, and there was no Rust. Um, I can't remember the other one. We had one more. Uh, it wasn't Haskell, but it was like, it was like a bunch of languages and we would do the same thing in all of the languages so you could get a sense of, well, why is a random number so hard to do in C? Uh, versus, you know, because it's low level and, but it, that didn't work because it was just too much. We couldn't get it done in an hour. We couldn't do all three hello worlds in an hour. We had to, 
you know, break it up even more. So we're going to stick with Go and that's that's coming up and then we'll see if that works. If it doesn't work, we adapt. This is why I have a boost every year. Same reason hey, I used Rob, to, yeah. Can I touch on the sure. boost? And, yeah, please. and I don't want to, I don't want to touch on the stream like everyone's beginners, but yeah. Um, one, I, I think the boost is really awesome because one, even I even go to it for reference and I um, uh, recommended it or I actually told my friend, this is, this is, if you, because he wants to get into tech, I'm like, this is what you want to do. This is the no bullshit, no fucking around. <laughs> excuse my French, uh, 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 course. And so yes, you have to do for work, but you okay, have to be highly yeah. motivated. But you know, your, your first lesson, I think, it was skill t the skill stack ver uh, v2, where oh, v2, you don't yeah. even go into programming, Bash, anything, uh, oh. Linux, anything, and you're just talking about how to troubleshoot the the thinking of googling, finding the right source. Why is yeah. sort? Why is having sort? You know looking at source so important stuff like this like the very core foundations where you don't even get taught this in, in computer science no <laughs> no college so that's why i started and, the company because nobody was teaching it i mean no. in 2013 in america i mean raise your hand if you knew of any public school in america teaching programming period in 2013 I mean, yeah, you could no, you no. could say AP computer science was teaching programming, but if you it's were bullshit. lucky enough, this is Java and a book. Yeah, and if you were really lucky enough to have an AP computer science program, I mean, the myth the myth and rumor in Amer over in my neighborhood is that somebody actually set up an AP program, and once they learned how to code in Java, they realized they could make like five times the money for a bank, and they abandoned the whole program. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's true, but that would track. Sounds true. <laughs> Sounds like it could be true. I mean, at the end of the day, and I don't want to get on like the, the skill stack um, is really, really beneficial. And my friend, and I didn't never told you about this, but my friend got his first IT job three months ago, and you know he was on the skill tech uh, skill stack of V two. Oh, was he? Me and him, and he his biggest thing is was what someone else said is starting their own project. And I gave him ideas, yeah. but it's hard when you. You know, yep. you have the material in front of you. I agree. And you, 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 you teach, you, you don't teach it, but you put this in there. It's like finding the right material, right? Because there's stuff out there. People like videos. Some people are visual learners. Yeah. Some people, right, aren't visual learners. And you see these videos that have five, six, seven million views. Oh, this is what this I need to do. One, uh, yeah. This is the best, you know, oh, Rust. This, yeah. this guy learns Rust. But in general, Rust is very very opinionated and it's very small on the yeah. totem scale of well, I think, what languages are actually being and used. It's, I mean I, I, I go I say this a lot but I, I do think it's about finding the right way for you to learn and know you got to come down to I mean it gets really you know yogic because you, you really have to know how you learn and I still think that human one-to-one -one communication is still the best way to learn no matter what and, and I actually am going through that right now. I, there's, uh, there are, um, are masters of other things that I uh, have are, are in working with in other areas and they, they assist me. And then, you know, I, one of them was, was here, Vera, the other day, right? Um, and this whole mentorship, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, one-on-two kind of thing, uh, is it dialectic teaching? Is that the official name? I don't know if that's the name, but that sounds really cool. Uh, comment from Tony Fa. I knew someone who did no less than six beginner Java books and never progressed. Eventually, need to practice it, like learning the mechanics of swimming and not swimming. See, I I am that guy who tends to dive in too early, and I I'm a little afraid of that too because if you dive in too early, then you don't you know. The, the, this is why I like many projects because you get the feeling of success. It's small, and it shows you okay, I'm ready to make my own projects eventually. It's kind of like training wheels. It's literally kind of like pushing you with a couple of projects, getting you going, and you're like, "Hmm, I want to make a project that does this." And they, and you're mm -hmm. like, "Okay, well, what do you know from these other projects that you can put into that project?" And mm -hmm. like, "Well, this project has this, and this project has this, and this project has this," and then they can yeah. synthesize the concepts from these other but things. That that's the problem, though, Rob. Yeah. Is, here's a great example to back that off: is Kubernetes, right? The, oh God! The, everyone wants to learn it right now. It's <laughs> yeah. high in demand, right? Uh, you go on uh, YouTube, you look at the Kubernetes, and they're 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 not like bare bones setting up. They're not doing Kube ADM. They're 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 just doing the the quickest way and doing all this automation. And yeah. it's not the best way to to of course of course that's going to be easy to spin up and just copy some code from from this dude's yeah. Git repo. But that's not teaching you. Yeah, I, you know I, I that is what C and I might choose. Like it's yeah, not teaching it, it is definitely that. a pet peeve when a lot of the YouTube stuff is so clean. 
uh, yeah. that they, they don't show the mistakes that you make while you're going through it. Exactly. And I, I don't like that because, because it does come off as, Oh, this person's smarter than me. Uh, they've done the tutorial and, you know, and I suck at it <laughs> when it's organic and messy. And I, I told you before, I've like, I've run people into the wall on purpose before, um, so that they can see a common mistake uh, and experience it. They get mad at me when I do that, by the way. Um, but, but, you know, and then, and then go back. I, it, it, it's just, you know, it's about, it's about experience and, and, but you still have to go through something comprehensive eventually. Uh, you can't just focus on projects. So it is a balance. It's a different balance. Harvard CS50 is pretty good. Yeah, it is pretty, it's gotten better. They do scratch and C in Python. They do. Yeah. Uh, Christian Macharia's group discussions were also dialectic. Interesting. Yeah. Um, just reading through the comments here. Um, a college with Java, C++, and C Sharp. I think it's unfortunate that they, they focus on object-oriented languages for beginners. I, honestly, I really do. Uh, especially going through the whole Lambda Calculus section. The Lambda Calculus is not object-oriented. It's function-oriented. Everything is a function in Lambda Calculus. This is why Lisp was the main language at, 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 at MIT for all those years. And then they switched to Python and they jumped on the object-oriented bandwagon. And the first thing they teach everybody is the class. I, I think it's counterintuitive. I hope that changes. I really do. I, I do. I hope that changes because teaching single inheritance Java uh, classes is not a good way uh, to form uh, a young person's brain, in my opinion. That That is bad. Because you, also, speaking of jumping on the object-oriented bandwagon, the yeah. approach almost everyone takes is class-oriented programming languages, yeah. not object-oriented programming yeah. languages. It sounds like you saw the the Jim Copeland video. Yeah, but what's well, easier? Sure but what's e but what's easier to learn, class or object? Right. Yeah. Well, they're different right. paradigms. Yeah. Well, they're similar looking but functionally different paradigms. Yep. But it, it's just like, am I going to teach? I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yes and no. Well, yeah, yes. But at the same time, is if you have a program where people are paying forty thousand dollars a year. You know, like what's the easiest thing to teach, and and like what's technically, I guess, in high demand. But a lot of the shit's outdated. We all yeah. know. <laughs> like, yeah, that's that's those are huge what topics. Pro, okay, here, <laughs> what university is teaching Go? What university is Nobody. teaching containerization? No, like, they, they they used to teach Haskell, and they, the list people they got yelled at because it's not practical. The, colleges have to make a decision. They're like, are we teaching people the concepts, or are we teaching them to get jobs? And most of them have decided that they're not teaching them to get jobs. They're teaching them the concepts. And that yeah. becomes a and problem. Also and also, like, the consideration of what the programs even are teaching. Like, a lot of these programs are supposed to be computer science programs, yeah. not software engineering right. programs. They're not under engineering schools. Exactly. They're often in the same, like, school as, a, as the mathematics or... Yep. Other well, yeah, it, I mean, it's kind of all blended in now. Nowadays, I think uh, a CS degree is blended in. Yeah, with it depends on where you go. You get a, it's it all often blended. gets confused in, yes, but yeah. like fundamentally, they all started at, or almost all of them started as science discipline. Yep. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm, um, yeah, boy, we could we could really let that one go. I mean, this this leads yeah. into the education system question and everything. <laughs> And yeah. we'll we'll have to like <laughs> save it. We're we're a little over time here. We'll we'll have to save That's that for another session night. On its own. Um, yeah, I believe me. We we could talk all night about that. And and there are educators in our community would love to join in on that. Hey um, Rob, on on Fridays, I think we should both crack open some IPAs while we're doing the Q and A's. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I try to keep this. I mean, I do have a little vodka in here, but because because nice. it's you know a little bit easier on the belly. That's what I like to hear. But but you know. Uh, <laughs> I disagree. I found <laughs> software engineering programs aren't as nearly as practical as the name would suggest. I yes, yeah, so let's 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 not go any further on that point today. Wait, and can, this, can if anything, this is great. We got a great conversation going on here. I hate to cut it off, but in Security Lab, I see you're in our audience. Thank you for being there, and thank you for contributions. All those subs that you just did, that was really grateful. I'm really grateful for that. It was very nice. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to commit to you that we're going to do this. Actually, I'm going to keep this on the Friday afternoon schedule. Uh, there may be occasionally times that I will delete it off. Um, uh, I, I, as we go out, I do think there's a couple more questions I just want to answer real quick. Uh, so we have, oh, I, I'm going to save that one for another day. How do you deal with bad management for Matt? Uh, we're going to add that one later. How do you deal with, uh, how do you, do you have any advice on how to stay motivated? Another great question. Uh, 
that you recommend for learning new languages? Do you have platforms for learning new languages? Uh, you know what? That's enough questions for for another day. So I'm 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 actually in the middle of copying these out. If I can get my what what's going on? Why are you not working? Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm I'm gonna put those for the next for the next day. Uh, so that, that we'll do those on Monday. So stay tuned for Monday. Uh, these will show up Saturday morning tomorrow at nine. Uh, I have to wait for the Twitch. Uh, I I really want to thank everybody on the panel for Z Velocity, Ryan and Mr. Shells. Ryan, we had a question that we were gonna specifically ask for you. Do you mind coming back on Monday? I don't oh, even remember absolutely. what it was. I am there. What was it? What were we gonna ask? I can't remember. We were gonna talk about Visual Studio Code at Microsoft's old. Oh, movie. that's right. Oh, it's such a controversial thing. I'm glad we didn't do that today. That would have, that would have taken a good. <laughs> let's make sure we start with your question. Uh, how should we? How should we put that question so everybody can know to come tune in on Monday? Uh, Ryan actually found something very interesting out, and we're gonna leave you hanging on this. Um, but I think the question. I, in fact, I wrote it in the chat here. Let me see. It's in questions, conversations. Um, Let's see. And Poisson, Poisson D also had a great, great question uh, that we're going to have to skip. Oh, the question is, is VS Code open source? And the answer, spoiler alert, is no. So Well, it's more complicated than no. It is. It is. <laughs> it is. But the if you're using the VS Code that you downloaded, you're downloading proprietary software. And we <laughs> will have a big, awesome uh, talk about that on on Mondays. Assuming you want to be here, Ryan. Can you be here on? Oh, if, yes. if you can, that's we fine. Um, if you're not here by for any reason at all, I'll just save that question. We'll do other stuff. So once again, thank you to the to the panel. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and close this down here. Uh, any final thoughts before we go, panel? Do you have anything? Matt's been very quiet. He's lurking in the background there with his sunglasses on. Party time. <laughs> <laughs> it is Friday. <laughs> All right, my friends. I mean, I have a question for next week. If, if oh, okay, uh, you, if, what, you uh, want to write it down? Is, Let's write it down. What yeah. is it? Um, how to balance work life and mental health? Like, oh, you know, taking gosh. a break, being able to step away from the PC. Oh, and I know Rob, gosh. you you have had some good experience with that lately. And bad, you know. <laughs> And I know Tanya, I mean, I've talked to her. She probably doesn't remember me, but I had some k issues and like me managing a multi-cluster when I barely knew shit. And oh, yeah. she was like, you're going to need to take a break. And, <laughs> um, and one, two, I'm not even getting paid for what I should be getting paid. right? And that's hopefully why I get this new position. <laughs> this, is how, this, is manage, this is how you manage it. You can, you can give your teddy bear a hug. <laughs> oh, I need a teddy bear. Can you send that over to me for a little? <laughs> I don't even care. You know what? It works. It works. You know, Mossy got me that that stress relieving, like like whatever furry thing. Uh, that'll be fun. We'll talk about that on Monday too. Wait, um, when did you get that chair behind you? The, uh, the chair, the lazy boy. Oh, when did you get that? We we could talk about all of that next week. This this the chair okay. is, is is my captain's chair. I sleep in that sometimes. Sometimes on stream on accident. So. <laughs> Uh, all right, my awesome. friends. Bye-bye, right. YouTube. See ya.